Is that it? Dang. Hello, 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 hello. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Uh oh, you can't hear me at all? Cool. All right. I just got the go ahead from me, my assistant executive producer. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right. So here we go. Okay, let's try this again. Once again, welcome to the show. Antonio, how you doing, bud? Welcome to the show. The new show. That's right. I told you about the new format. And uh, by the way, everybody, happy new year. And uh, welcome to the first show of the year. All right. So with all that out of the way, let's talk about what we got planned today. All right. So first, I want to sit there and remind everybody, it's still early in the year. So it is never too late to get your monthly membership, your membership card. Um, there's two levels. Hero and Legend. Hero and Legend. All right. Now, the Hero membership costs $39.99. Here's the wonderful thing. You get an item every month that's worth $3.99 for free. All right? So, essentially, you get your membership back in then some because you get $48 worth of free stuff for a $40 membership. All right? Plus, you get a 15% discount. And you can save up to $100 on any one item. So, go figure. All right? So, then there's the Legend, which is amazing. It's $79.99. But you get a $5 item, you know, and 20% discount on an item. So, you know, when you add that up, 10 stamp cards on the hero gets you a $10 value for 10 stamp card. And 10 stamps on the legend gets you a $15 value that you can use for just about everything in the store. And trust me, these memberships are worth their weight in gold. I have used mine. And if I told you the savings... You go, what? All right, so trust me. Those memberships are worth having. I've had one since the day they came into creation. I've always had the top tier. It is the most excellent membership you will ever see. I do believe that. So, all right. So let's talk about things. So I've told you the first thing we'll talk about is something that came in new. Happy Friday, Sarah. Yes. Ah, you tried to come back. It's okay. So check this out. This has always been a favorite. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons favorite. It's called Dungeons. It's a fantasy board game. Uh, it is so cool. And uh, it is, it's a real fun game. It is. You run around this crazy board and you, and you just do wild and crazy things. All right? So I'm not going to talk a lot about it. it it's, a, it's an old classic. It's been around, but you know what? They just came back in. And I just couldn't help myself but tell you about it because they, we haven't had it in a while. So a lot of fun for the whole family. So there we go, Dungeon. Got to come and get it. <clears throat> now, this is by Gale Force 9. This is Tyrants of the Underdark, where you can sit there and fight for and control the Underdark. Board games are fun. They're fun for a lot of people. You can play them. They, they play in a, in a quick amount of time. Uh, this game will play, I think if I remember correctly, somebody's saying it'll play in about, oh, there we go, about 90 minutes or so. 90 minutes to 100, basically an hour and a half to two hours, two to four players. It's a lot of fun. A really nice board game and cards. It's a simple game. It's just uh, it's a strategy game. You're trying to take over the Underdark, and who wouldn't want to seize the Underdark and make it there with all its secrets and mysteries, right? So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to tell you the truth. Not a lot of stuff came out since Christmas. <laughs> they haven't had time to catch up. <laughs> oh, that's the way it works. But these came in. One's a restock. The other one's a newer product. Always got to talk about them based on Dungeons & Dragons, right? All right, so as I told you last year, we were going to pick a topic every month and talk about it. And I already told you what it was. Uh, we're going to talk about the Dungeon Master. You know, we, we don't have a Dungeon Master. We really don't have much of a game. We don't have players. But we're going to talk about the players next. So Dungeon Masters. Uh, somebody asked me a question. How hard is it to become a Dungeon Master? 
They sent me the question. I'm like, oh, that's right up. That's a good question, you know. It's as simple or as hard as you really want to make it. Um, and I say that because there's so much product out there that can help you just get started, right? Or you can try to piece it together step by step and create your own campaign and just jump in there head first, okay? My suggestion, and now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of things. How to become a dungeon master. Mine, and I even made a bunch of notes. Notes. Okay. Biggest thing is the first thing you have to do is decide where am I going to start? Am I going to do a homebrew, which I don't suggest at first, or am I going to find myself somewhere that I can start? And I've told you about the starter kit, so I'm not really going to get into the starter kits, but I believe that that sets you up for success. Okay. You have to learn to walk before you can run, they say. That is true. You have to have the basics and you have to have the, the techniques and the mechanics of whatever it is you're trying to learn to do down before you can start flying off the handle and starting to invent things and design your own things. And that's why I suggest that. I prefer the box sets, the pre-made adventures to start with over creating your own campaign. All right, so let's start there. Creating characters. <clears throat> That's the first thing that you're going to be running into because you're going to need players, right? All right, so you have to decide how we're going to create our characters. In the player's handbook, it tells you that. Okay, now, and I'm going to kind of compare the two. Remember the easy and the hard, the easy and the hard because we're starting out as a new game master, a new dungeon master. Okay, we're a dungeon master. We have to create these characters now. And the starter sets, they come with pre-made characters. Do you have to use them as is? No. Once you read up with the little things, you can change a couple things on them. But I like them because it makes it simple for a character and for the player, for the player and for the game master to do. Like this palette, it's already filled out. It's got all its abilities through third level. It's got all its abilities, its proficiencies, languages, attacks. Everything's already made out. So you hand this to a new player as the game master. I come and say, hey, guys, here go all these characters. It doesn't matter, male, female. You can make it whatever you want. Okay? You lay them out for them. And you say, read those over and see what you like. They're new players. They don't really know what they're looking at anyway. All right? So once you've read, and this is where it comes down, you got to do a little bit of homework. All right? The starter sets each come with an abridged rule book. So it has a lot of this information that you see in these three books here. Like this is the uh, Fendelver, the Mines of Fendelver. It will have all the adventure, all the NPCs, all the monsters, all the rules right in here in this rule book. And I say that because it's nice to familiarize yourself with the terms initiative, skill check, DC, okay, saving throw. Once you familiarize with that, and that's all explained in here, okay? Now, I'll, I'll kind of go over it, so let's open up this book here, all right? Let's take a look at it. All right. So this is really nice. Look at that. So it talks about the six abilities, okay? Um, and, and here we go. I'll just kind of read this because these are things that you're going to want. I'm just kind of throwing this at you. I'm not going to go into every little aspect of the game, but you got to understand what the six abilities are and what they do, okay? So we got strength, measuring physical power. Okay. Dexterity, measuring agility. Good. Constitution, measuring endurance. All right. Intelligence, measuring reasoning and memory. All right. Wisdom, measuring perception and insight. All right. Charisma, measuring force of personality. Okay, I'm digging it. You're always going to have a question about that. But if you want to know about the difference between perception, insight, and investigation, perception, and insight or intelligence and wisdom, ask Antonio. He'll explain it to you via the fruit salad. All right? And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay, then he'll talk about what the ability score numbers will do. Everywhere from 3 to 30, but characters won't see a 30. And he'll talk about what they do, advantage and disadvantage, which is very important. Um, one allows you to roll two dice and take the higher. One allows you to roll – one makes you – Roll two dice and take the lower. All right, so there you go. It talks about ability checks. It explains ability checks to you. So what I'm getting at is these books, once you read this book, this, 
I guess not really a book, it's a uh, pamphlet. You'll get all the basics that you need to at least to use the verbiage necessary in Dungeons and Dragons. Strength checks, dex checks. Where's the saving throws, okay? What is a saving throw? All right. The order of combat. It'll teach you step by step the order of combat. Now, yes, you can find that in the DMs guide. Yes, you can go to a player's handbook and you can put it all together. But I'll tell you what, for $20, and I'm going to tell you the price because I want you to understand this. Unlike many hobbies that will cost you a fortune to get into, you get into Dungeons and Dragons, you get this book here. You open it up and you start to learn terminology. Initiative. Why is initiative important? It determines the order of combat. Okay. What actions can I take? What actions can my players take as, as players when it comes to combat? What can they do when it's their turn? Okay. So that's all here. Surprise, positions, initiative, take turns, and it goes into everything that you can do to turns, reactions, attack rolls. What I roll to attack, what do I add to the attack? So these are all things that you're going to at least have to be familiar with as a game master. So it's not just as simple as opening up a board game, reading this, oh, here we go. Okay. It's, it is it is and it isn't. Now, let's back up again to the players. My player characters are going to walk into the game. Are we going to roll 3D6 and just keep that total? And we're going to do it in order. That's an old school way of doing it. Am I going to take 4D6, right? Roll 4D6. And take the higher three. You kick out the smaller one, the lowest one. Or, and then there's a lot of house rules, but let's just stick to what comes in the book. There's a point buying method, all right, that's also in the book. So there's a lot of things that you have to decide when you go this route, when you're just going off on your own. Here, you have predetermined stats. It kind of helps you. So that's the first decision that you have to make as a game master, as the dungeon master. Am I going to go with something that's already pre-planned pre out for me to help me, or am I just going to go from scratch? All right. If we go from scratch, we got to make a lot of more decisions. NPCs. I got to go into the monster menu and pull out monsters for the, what, the adventure. Uh, they're going to run into this cave. What are they going to find? Who told them? Who's the NPC who told them? to go to the cave. Over here, it's already taken care of for you in, in, the, in the adventure. Here, you have to make it up as you go. All right, I think something happened there. Sorry, gang. I, I got bumped out. Not quite sure, but all right. So back to this. All right, so here, as an example, is the Lost Find of Fendelver. You can actually find every monster that you're going to need in here. And with its, like the, uh, here we go, Hobgoblin, with all its stat block, everything that's there. You're going to have all the NPCs that will direct you through that you're going to meet, the creatures that you're going to encounter, and how to run the entire adventure right in this pamphlet. Okay, that's awesome. Over here, you've got to create it all from scratch. Now, the Dungeon Master's Guide is a wonderful tool to help you do that because it will take you step by step on how to create an adventure. All right? How to create the characters. Once again, over here, it's pre-created. You've got your adventure. You've got your monsters. You've got your NPCs. That's my suggestion. Just a suggestion. Okay. Okay. Next step in DMing is how long do I want to make my session? How is it going to be a one shot adventure just to kind of get my feet wet and kind of get the mechanics down and the basics down? Or am I going to turn this into a campaign? Well, here's the easy answer to that one run it as a one shot, get familiarized with all the different techniques and the mechanics, the initiative, the saving throws, the skill, the skill rolls. Help the players learn to use their characters. That's also a part of 
what you so as you're teaching yourself, you're also teaching the players. Okay, the DM is the end all. All right, so then decide. Hey, this was worked out really well. Let me now incorporate this into my next adventure. And this adventure, in a way that is kind of open, it kind of like when you when you see a, a series. You know how when you're watching a series, episode one leads to episode two, leads to episode three. Well, that's a campaign. That's essentially, if you look at a series like the Lord of the Rings or um, the the Game of Thrones, how every episode led to another episode, led to another episode. Led, well, that's exactly how adventures are in a campaign. One leads to the next, and you always leave it open-ended. Uh, the difference is that it may not go in the direction you thought it would, but that's okay because... The adventure world, the world that you create, the adventure that you create, unless it's something linear, should kind of sprout off in the different directions. Okay, and that's kind of where you start juggling things as a dungeon master. But okay, let's back up again, back to what it takes to become a dungeon master at first, right? Let's keep with that. All right. So, like I said, I, I would start with, with a, a a pre-planned, uh, with a pre-written adventure. Now. Here's the other thing too. Okay, you have to decide as a dungeon master. So you've got your you got your adventure, you've got your dice. And these boxes come with a starting set of dice. I would also suggest beginning uh, dungeon masters. I would always suggest to have a two or three extra sets of dice. They don't have to be expensive, you know, eighty ninety dollar metallic or gemstone dice or anything like that. Four ninety nine will get you eight. Very practical, very usable set of polyhydra dice with your 4 through 20 in it, with your percentile dice in it, $4. Buy a couple sets or at least ask your players to at least uh, invest into them so each person has their own dice. Now, here's the thing. When you're creating the characters, if you don't do the, pre, the, 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 the starter sets, then when you do it this way, you're going to need four. Unless you do the point by system, you're gonna need dice, extra four sided dice to roll. You put them all together, but you know people people are finicky about their dice, and I get it. Um, I have dice that I lend out, and dice that I would never lend out. So remember that. Get those extra dice, so that you have them, so that your players don't have to. Oh, I didn't bring any dice. Oh, I didn't know I needed those kind of dice. You know, it's hard. Remember, these are first time players. You're a first time game master. It's on you. This is your game. This is your world. Your game that you're creating, all right? All right, so we get that done. We decide here's what we're going to do. We're going to run the Mines of Endeavor, or there's another starter set. And uh, it's really nice, too. It's basically the same thing. Dragon, it's the Dragon of Aspire, uh, um, oh, my God, of Icepire Peak. Okay, that's another nice adventure. Once again, it's nice and thick. It has everything that you need in it. So there's a couple of different modules. And, of course, there's the book, the, the book sets. Um that come the, the, the TM ad and so on and so forth. But I like to stick with these starter sets because they were specifically designed for new game masters and new players. So game masters, get a hold of one of these boxes, read a little bit, get your group together, and then get going. All right. So now anything when you're – and now we're kind of jumping back to this side. Okay, I'm going back and forth because on this side there's not a lot to talk about because everything's in the box set for you. That's why it's called the starter set. The adventure is laid out for you. All you have to do is read it, get yourself familiarized with the mechanics and the terminology, and pretty much you're good to go. All right? And that's what I suggest. Now, we're going to talk about being a DM not only for the first time, but running your own for the first time, which is where the books come in. So you have to decide how big of a skill you're going to have. How much do the starter sets cost? The either starter set is only $19.99. So for a $20 bill, you can get it. Or it'll be, I think with tax, it'll be like $21.19, $21.20, something like that. Um, you know, get a gift card. <laughs> get someone to get you a gift card for $22 and you're good to go. And it comes with a set of dice. I mean, I've shown this box sets. I have them all here laid out in front of me so I can talk about different things and show them to you. Uh, but for tw a $20 investment, you can't beat it. And that box will get you going in the right direction. All right. So when you're talking with your characters, okay, and this is kind of getting into a little bit more advanced things, but I'm kind of going over things. 
that I want you to put in your head uh, as a game master for the first time. If you, let's say we have a, let's not say we, I always run a session zero. And session zero, now we're talking about in your own campaigns. Here, there's not really a session zero except for the part, the little prelude that you tell the players to get them to the to the uh, adventure, all right? And there's a little backstory that gets everybody there. Uh, for the most part, like let's take this paladin. It tells you about humans, humans, are the most numerous people in the Forgotten Realms because these take place in the Forgotten Realms. Then back here, it tells you about your noble background. You know, your family is no stranger to wealth, power, and privilege. Uh, it goes on. A personal goal, rejuvenating uh, pil pilgrimage. So it kind of gives you a little backstory, a background to your character. So going from this, okay, the pre-made character, human paladin, and now let's jump over here to where we're creating. We're helping the characters create their own characters. The players create their own characters. What you see on this sheet is a very valuable, it's very valuable information because you go and you go, huh, okay. So I want them to, okay, this is all done for you. Proficiency languages, attacks, the paladin class, what it is, okay. And his abilities and all that, that's all right. What's really neat is back here. When you start putting together their backgrounds. Now, they can pick their background and in there they get to choose a lot of little things, qualms about their quirks, their their um, strength, their, there's a weak, their flaw, um, all kinds of things, okay, in the player's handbook. But the neat thing is that they can take that and expound on it and create a background for their character. And I think that that is what really solidifies the player with the character because they bring it to life with their background, all right? And that's something that you have to help them with. Uh, you've got to give them ideas about where, where where is this world at where are we playing what what kind of things have happened here before what's happening you know and you kind of got to get them okay so why is your character going on an adventure why are you becoming an adventure um, you're a paladin you served your church why have you turned to adventuring okay the road the road what, what are your aspirations do you want to one day become a guild master of your own guild do you want to join a prominent guild do you just want to work freelance? Where are you going to go for it? Are you going to become a spy master, an assassin? Okay. The warrior. Does he want to become a warlord one day? You know, what what has led you to that? What what led you to this point of wanting to become an adventurer? And you can get things from, well, the orcs came down from the mountains and destroyed my settlement. You know, um, there was a demon attack and they, they killed all my family. So on and so forth. But you help them with that, and you help them develop their characters. This is all part of being a dungeon master. And what I'm getting to, what I'm leading into is, then you have to determine how much role playing am I going to do? Because here's the thing for all you starting dungeon masters. <clears throat> they are the player characters. That's it. They are the player characters. But... The barking dog, the cows, the tavern owner, the lady who's the, the baker, the lady who's the baker, the blacksmith, the traveling merchant, the bandits, the monsters, the orcs, the goblins, the ferocious dragon. That, my friend, is all you. You are everything else in that world. You are from the river flowing down to the avalanche coming down the mountains. You portray all of that. That's why you're called the Dungeon Master. Or sometimes also known as the Game Master. Because yes, not every adventure happens in a dungeon. But it's Dungeons and Dragons and thus you're a Dungeon Master. Alright, so that's something that you also have to determine as a Dungeon Master. So there's a lot of things that you got to take into when you first decide to become a dungeon master, all right? But I think that one is the most crucial. Okay, And you don't have to develop these characters, uh, every single one of the NPCs. I call them characters, but they're NPCs, non-player characters, all right? So the players play the PCs. 
known as that player characters. They run what? Everything else in the game is an NPC or a monster. It's a non, well, it's an NPC, a non-player character. Now, the distinction has been made between non-player characters being um, the tavern keepers and that, and then, of course, the monsters or everything else. But everything that's not a player character is a non-player character, and it's run by you. That's what you need to remember. As far as role-playing and how much you want to develop the characters, we can get into that. We're going to get into that later, but I think that anything that's going to be a primary character and someone who's going to be a, what I like to call a foundation character NPC, in other words, the mayor, the guild master that gives them work, the tavern keeper, maybe that merchant that hires them all the time. If you're going to have that kind of character, then you're going to want to develop that character, that person, as if they were a character. Build them as if take the time, build them up. Just like the monsters come with their stat blocks, create a, a character sheet for them, and then you have, and you don't need a lot of them. You might have like two or three. Maybe four of them at a time because these are important characters. The mayor, the, the like I said, the mayor, the guild master, the the merchant, um, so so on and so forth. Whoever you determine is important enough to be that they're going to have regular interaction with. That's going to send them out. Like in my world, I have a guild, a players, uh, an adventuring guild, and you know there's certain characters. That have their character sheets because they are instrumental. They're the guild master, the assistant guild master, the the the, 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 um, the guild masters of each of the separate guilds. I have those characters drawn up because that's why I know what they do and don't know, what they can and can't do. Okay, that's important. But we're going to get into role playing at a later date. Today, I'm just kind of throwing a lot of stuff at you so that you know what you're getting yourself into and what you really must bare bones have to have in order to be able to be an efficient dungeon master. I didn't say you're going to be great. Uh, Dominic, what role does the mayor play? Well, that's good. Ah, your keyboard is, that's all right, Dom. All right, well, welcome to the show. What role does the mayor play? Well, okay. So in talking about that, we if you develop the mayor, let's say the mayor is a play a major role. Uh of course, he runs a town, but he may be the one who's trying to get rid of that orc tribe in the mountains that keeps coming down and killing their sheep, have killed a farmer or two. You know, so far, the orc incursion hasn't really come into town, the outlying ranches, okay? But, but in time, it's going to start affecting the town because the town relies on that cattle to sell. So that they can subsist themselves. Okay. Remember, <coughs> excuse me, merchants played a very important part. And uh, in those times, if you look at if you look at the way the whole D D thing is set up, villages had their own unique little something, whatever it may be. In this, in this, it may be because we're on nice grasslands, we, we can raise cattle. There's many ranches, and maybe we can have some kind of agriculture. Another place, though, may be unique for a certain type of fruit or, or, um, or, you know, it might be a mining community. So the mayor is now trying to find an adventuring party to come in and deal with these orcs. So I would build that. I would flesh that mayor out and have him on a character sheet so I know what his skills are. I know, and I would build him to where he may be charismatic. However, I want to build this guy. I build. I'm going to make him charismatic because he's been able to hold this this community together, even with the orcs attacking, and maybe even a, a raid or two by bandits. You know, that's that's not an unforeseen. Hey, it's the Dungeons and Dragons world. A lot of different things can happen. So he's trying to reach out to an adventuring group, and he has to make it attractive enough for them to come in and, and, and take care of this problem, which is a major problem. Orcs are no joke. Okay, so he's going to be the one who's going to do all the negotiating because he may be the mayor, but this may be a small town. You know, he's the mayor, but he doesn't have a lot of, it's not like he has an army. He might have a militia, you know, and militias are nice, you know, when they're dealing with one or two things. But, you know, uh, uh, 10 orcs come down, that's a different story. You know, they're brutal, they're mean, they, they're, they're pretty buff, and the militia... You know, the militia is made up of whoever volunteers, whoever you can get the, 
put on whatever old armor they have and draw out their spear or bow. And, you know, they're not well trained. And usually they don't fare very well against an organized attack. So they want some adventures because that's what they do. They go out and they take care of these kind of situations. So that's a major role that this mayor is playing. And I could go for anybody. That you could substitute the name mayor for guildmaster. You could substitute guildmaster for village elder. Village elder. You know, you could take that out and make it the town constable. Whoever it is you feel is going to be that go-to person in whatever village, town, city you're working out of. You need to develop that character. Okay? So that's, that's what I mean by the, that would be the role that this mayor would play. Although, now here's a Dominic. That's a great, here we go. Let's, let's reverse that. Let's turn that around now. Let's not make the mayor the good guy. huh? What if the mayor knows that there's a vein of gold or of silver in the, in the hills and he wants to get the people to get the heck up out of here? He wants the townspeople to move away, right? But. The local merchant, you know, is like, wait a minute, my, these these orcs keep coming down to raid. You know, the mayor has told these orcs, hey, listen, here's what I need you to do, and I'll give you this. And he's paying them, right? So now the mayor is the bad guy, all right? So we're going to turn this around. And the merchant is trying to hire the adventuring group to come in. Hey, good seeing you, brother. I know you're up there working in New York. It's probably cold and rainy from what I hear, huh? But welcome to the show. Um, so now the mayor is the bad guy. He, How are we going to play him? Well, we're going to try and thwart him, thwart the merchant by telling the players they're not welcome here. Well, this is my town. I don't want you. I've got my militia. I don't need you. I've got my constable who could be some unfortunate guy who's a fool and is just kind of being run around by the mayor. Or he may be in on it. It depends on how you want to go with that, right? So that's the neat thing about being the dungeon master. You can do all those things. You can put those twists in there. Okay? The mayor may be able to, maybe in, maybe a great, hey, I think this is a great idea. And he's in on every planning meeting. And any sister sends messages to the orcs to tell them what's going on. Oh, man. You get what I'm saying, right? So there you go. But anyway, all right. So... Box set, box, the box starting event, starting sets are amazing to get going with. I know I threw a lot out there to you beginning dungeon masters, but I want you to be mentally prepared because it's a lot. It's I know I've said it's it can be easy, and it can be if you go this route. I think it's a little more difficult if you just open up the books and try to start running your game. Okay, um, so I think that's about all I want to cover. I think I covered everything that I wanted to talk about, and it's a lot. Let me tell you something. That's why we're doing an entire month of dungeon mastering. <clears throat> and sometimes I will kind of jump off to a little on the topic that I wasn't ready to discuss, but that's okay because a lot of this is so intertwined in dungeon master. This is something. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So the thing about dungeon master is that a lot of this is intertwined. Okay. Short of the player characters. Okay. Once we design the player characters and they're set, that's great. But now you've got to take the NPCs, the monster, the campaign idea that you have, the setting, the atmosphere, and you've got to meld all that together. You've got to bring it all together so it works. And at first, it's going to be a little disjointed, okay? If things aren't going to quite match up, you're going to have like a jigsaw puzzle. It's, oh, well, this isn't the piece, and that, wait, that doesn't quite fit there. That's okay. Because eventually, you're going to be able to just kind of look at it and go, huh, boop, boop, boop. And a lot of people who have just started Dungeon Master will tell you that, that their first game, my gosh, it seemed like someone just took a 2,000-piece puzzle and just dumped it on the table and said, begin. And you know, at first it's hard, but then eventually you start getting to you kind of see the picture for me. You know what I'm saying? Just think of it like that and just be patient. Stick with it. And you'll have a great time, and so will the players. And that's what I'm going to leave you with on the last, last note. Remember, the game is supposed to be fun, okay? Not just for the players, but it's supposed to be fun for you too. I have a great time dungeon mastering. 
When it's throwing a dungeon master, he has a great time. It's got to be fun. You got to make it fun. All right. It's not about the rules in the end. It's about having fun. And I want to leave you with that. All right. Make sure that the game is fun for them and for you. And it'll be a great time to have by all. All right. So, like I said, I threw a lot of stuff out there. Uh, some of it will stick. The best part is that you can come back to this show and watch it as many times as you want. Okay. Hopefully, I kind of made things coherent for you. I kind of kept it in some kind of semblance of, of order. <laughs> I know I jump around a lot. I had my notes. Um, so, well, yeah, this is something I'm trying new to kind of help everybody. And um, next week, I'll continue on and move along into other things. Uh, now, talking about next week, the live show next week will probably be on Thursday. Probably at a th 1 o'clock, 12 o'clock or so, all right? I have a big tournament that I have to go officiate next weekend, and it, it requires Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So I'll be gone then, but I'm going to make sure that I do the, 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 the live show. And if nothing else, in case you can't jump on there, I'll remind everybody on Thursday, but if you can't jump on there, then I will. it will be up here in the sequence because I'm going to label them all. This is all January, um, the, the the month of the Dungeon Master, all right? So other than that, remember, we have these wonderful monthly memberships with all their benefits, both the hero and the legend. Get them, get them, get them. I'm telling you, they're well worthwhile. We're always getting new things in, so definitely come into the store. And as always, may the road rise up to meet your feet, and may all your ventures be successful. So it's John from John's Dungeon Corner from The Collective in Altamont Springs, Florida, saying, see you next week.